now we're definitely going to be challenged around a sense of purpose. I usually see Richard in quite a skimpy little sort of possum fur buka and um, gorgeous makeup ochre paint. So he's, he's dressed differently today. I'll have to listen in a different sort of way, but here to expand our thinking, challenge our perspective. Um, you, in Richard's bio, which is on the app and in, in things, you'll, you'll read that Richard operates a family-owned Aboriginal productions and promotions company, which sometimes takes him to France to perfume um, conferences the last five years, also leading some of the really spectacular um, Wadanji um, Festival, which is part of the Fremantle Festival, and that's coming up on the 31st of October, so every year you're part of that. And family is many generations, so you see many ages of Wallies and their connections um, added in. So I would, um, I think I'm just, that's it. it. It's over to you to challenge us. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad to be here and definitely going to put some challenges out to you. The, the headings that you actually put around the wall are absolutely fantastic because they become uh, prompts to what they actually can speak about. Uh, in our culture, there are three, um, three pillars to what, what we do and who we are. It's identity, belonging and responsibility. And once you figure out your identity, your belonging, your responsibility, everything interlinks. Um, I am going to actually put some challenges to you because part of our culture is what we call passive learning. So exactly what we spoke about before, if you go home as a changed person and there's a radical change, you've got resistance all over the place because people get conditioned to who you are if they, or they think they know who you are at that stage. And any radical change just challenges their, 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 their visions of you. In our culture, we have that passive change. So people can actually allow that passive change to be integrated into the everyday actions. So that's very important with us. Uh, I'm going get, to get, get your challenge right at the start. I want to see if you can... There's three things I want you to do. I want you to see if at your table you can find that the one thing that we all have in common. Uh, again, I'm going to give you a challenge in about a minute to do that one. Then I'm going to give you a couple of uh, Google um, things you can do. So we, we know you've got the phones here and, and, and Google into a, a, couple of, um, a couple of sites. I want you to Google those. And, and then I'm going to get on with the presentation uh, on that. But the first one, just for 30 seconds, I want you to sit down as a, as a group. Well, you're sitting down already, so that's accomplished that one. And um, tell us what we have in common, the one thing that links us together. Uh, and we're just going to quickly do a, a table by table table with one word. It's just one word. What do we have in common? 30 seconds. The two reasons for this exercise is that the first one is you probably figured out you had more than 30 seconds. So that was a minute and a half. So in our culture, if you have to do things to deadlines and timelines, you've got to challenge at time. Are you going to get quality or are you going to get what you're after because you have to meet a deadline? That's just a question, whether it is or not. And yes, we do have to have deadlines for certain things and there have to be coordinations in that area. But it's a matter of figuring out which is which. Which one actually really needs a deadline, which one actually doesn't. And that's a bit of a challenge. Um, so I just want to quickly go around, and there's, there's a reason for this. I don't just do it for doing a survey and says, well, I did the survey and X amount of people said this. I've got my, my, my uh, answer to this, and, and I'm quite willing to be challenged on that answer as well. During this presentation, you got me for about 50, 50 minutes, including the questions and answers. Um, and during that time, you have licence to be politically incorrect. If you want to ask some curly questions, you think that Aboriginals are lazy or have got, got no idea of how to advance things, any of those sorts of questions that you think may be gnawing there you'd like to ask, please ask them and they'll be taken as part of the presentation and the engagement today. Ask them after I'm outside, we might have a debate, an argument, or put a defamation on you and all sorts of things. So, <laughs> so take advantage while it's here. Uh, and that's the, the reason for the exercise of this. Now, we can analyse things back to, to why into one reason. If you find the sources of some things, you can always find the, the, the way they operate and the mechanics around them, finding a source. So I'm going to quickly go from the tables in the end. Just, just shout out just loud 
what do you think they have one thing in common? I'm going to see if someone hits what I believe that we all have in common and what, what, what we are. So we're going to start from the end table. There's nothing, Adam, just, just shout out from table to table. We failed. Failed? Any, any tables? Shout, just shout it out. We're people. People. We're Language, sorry. Breathe. Breathe. Belonging. Belonging. Inclusion. Inclusion. Feel, feel emotions. emotions. We're, all We're all different. Yep. The land. Yes. The land. Sorry. Relationships. Relationships. Yeah. Um, in our culture, we say ngank ngarla birea, ngank, ngank ngarla birea. Ngank has a couple of words. So ngarla birea is our boss, the person who shapes us. Ngank, ngank in our language is the sun. The one sun links every one of us as people, plants, animals on this planet. Take that sun away, we're all in trouble. So we recognise that as a people thousands of years ago. Ngank, the sun, links us as a people. Ngank is also our mother. Every one of us come from our mother. So the ngank becomes very important in our, in, from that unifying us, not only as people, but links us with the plants and the animals. We have an obligation to maintain that balance. Ngank. Ngank is also the thumb. That gives us our balance within our hands. And the final one that ngank stands for is our neck. So it has many words, ngank. So that neck, of course, links us and allows us to push around. And in some of our communities, they say, the man may be the head, but the woman is the neck. You tell her where to go, how to go, and hold you up and keep you linked to everything else. There's those connotations, and others have it the other way around. So, but the, the ngank is very important to us in that area. So once we get that link in common, then we find that us as a people, have, as our identity, then our belonging becomes more than just one sector. It, be, it belongs to the environment. We are linked in with the trees, with the animals, with the plants. We have an obligation to maintain a balance. So that linkage is, is part of nature. Nature's already given it to us. So a lot of the stuff that we come up with, the new ideas, innovations, connectivity, we can't improve on nature. Nature's already given us connectivity that has been there for thousands of years. And we use that in all different forms of, 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 um, of communication. The, uh, the other reason that I'm here, and it's only um, two words, Joel Levin. Simple as that. Joel gives me a call, we get together, connection. That's why I'm here. I can talk about it's a wonderful idea and I think you're, you're, what you're doing is fantastic, but it was Joel's connection that brought us together. So that interconnection between individuals and people are extremely important. In our communities, we value that. We value that, that connection to every individual person as something that, that should not be taken for granted. Um, I'm just going to give you another little exercise now before I get into a full-blown presentation, challenges, and I'll get some provocative questions out because I'm going to show you some provocative statements uh, to, because I believe we need to do that to shake up every now and then because if we're here to be friends and be friendly and, and, and influence people, we're kidding ourselves. We have to look at what is the challenges, what is the unlevel stuff. It's that. And again, in our culture, it's, uh, you see... The, the most strong, strongest of the elements, particularly plants and animals, are the ones who have actually endured a lot of stress. The greater the stress, the greater the strength. Uh, so that's very important to us. So what that did to me as, an, as a young man, it gave me the capacity to challenge some very leading uh, statements that were around, particularly in this region, when I was growing up about us as a people. Um, so I'm just going to get you to do two more Googles now. I just want you to Google, if you can, within your table, 
And just take notes of it. I want you to Google Nomad Two Worlds and just take some notes of what you think on that site. You've got about five minutes for this one. That'll probably go out to about seven, so you're, you're quite good there. And the other one I want you to Google is um, Natural Resource Stewardship Circle. That's it. So it's Natural Resource Stewardship Circle. And the first one, of course, is Nomad Two Worlds. Uh, don't worry about writing them down for them. Now, uh, if you don't get it, you're not going to get it. So my presentation's no writing, no signs, and there's a reason for that as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just keep your little notes on, on that. I'm going to go through a, a full presentation now, and during this time, from those two websites, just those two, on, I could take you to another 20, but we're not there. I want to just do an exercise from that. To, um, just to show you what can be done if you have patience and respect. They're the two things that are the cornerstone to us as a culture is patience and respect. Now, patience doesn't mean to say you're lazy, you have to wait around and say, look, I'm a very patient person, I'm doing nothing. It's not about that. It's about knowing when you have to make a move, uh, when, when the time is right, so that's very important to us as a culture. The, the reason I do a lot of my presentations how I do now, I, I do them in various degrees. One, I've got this nice, wonderful PowerPoint. We've got dancers coming up. We've got uh, music, got the arts. It's all wonderful. We can do all that. That's not a problem. But that's not what your group's about. Your group's not about entertainment and let's see what, what, what uh, beauty there is in the stories and the art. It's about the communication and connection. It, it's about influencing people. It's about how we sit within the, the tapestry of, of, of the, 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 the mats around us in that area. And the Aboriginal people, us and Yungar people, we had the epicentre right here of social harmony. This is one of the places, those of you who come from different parts of the world, you're, standing, you're sitting in a place now and you'll be walking in a place that had no organised conflict. There's very few places in the world you can walk around and say they never had any wars here. There's not one group fighting another group. As a matter of fact, it's glorified in some places. The statues are about the generals, the battles, the achievements of people in conflict with other people. We are actually opposite here. This is the avatar. We had social harmony that existed in our community for thousands of years that we didn't know what the idea of organised warfare was. Did we have skirmishes and disagreements and fights? Yes, we did. They were disorganised. And there's logic behind those. For reasons that would never happen today, someone pinch someone else's husband or wife, then they'd have a fight. The bigger fight was when they try to give them back. That's a... Well, no, <laughs> but... Um, you find that with logic in our cultures, you're sitting here in a place we call Wajak, Buja. And if you look at the hills, the Darling Ranges over there, that's called Karamurunda. Andy and some people living in, the, in Karamurunda. Yeah. Now, Karamurunda doesn't separate Wajak from Balladong, who's on the other side of the hills. It joins us. So that social harmony already existed with our neighbour. We had intermarriage, we had ceremonies, we shared. So Wajak can walk over that hill and still feel very much at home. Balladong walk over this side and, into, and feel at home. The Moor River does not separate Ewart from Wajak. It joins them. We can go to the other side of the river, they can come to this side of the river. It's shared. So borderlines actually were part of sharing. And you find that in, your, in, in, in the European countries, it causes the biggest problems. Which border stains where, who's going to conquer who, we're going to change it. Even countries have changed names. So when you look at, at what we have here, you have a blueprint for social harmony. Now that blueprint for social harmony can be transferred to many other different sectors. We had a medical system that operated here with no hospital. So when I draw, draw my, my maps and stuff, I do a, 
a big circle and say, this was our health system that operated in our culture. Then I'll do a small circle in the middle. This is the health problems we had within that health system. Of course, it's reversed now. We have a huge health problem and a system that can't cope. We had a justice system that operated here for thousands of years, had a system with a huge circle, with the perpetrators in a very small circle. We're trying to build bigger jails today. The system that operates in the Western society is failing. It's failing. There's no debate about that. We can grab the figures and show those figures on a yearly basis how, how it's increasing in the crime, the health is deteriorating. So if you were an early settler and you came from a place like England, let's put it there, you're leaving poverty, you're leaving the, the, the overcrowdedness, all the areas you've got, all the issues that you have, you hop in a boat and you come here and you land in a place here. So you've come from a place that's got overcrowded jails, you've had plagues, you've had all sorts of problems and issues and health issues over there. You have, you have a, a, a system of uh, monarchies uh, and, and, and uh, hierarchies that exist. You can take all of those operations within your society, then you land in a place like this. Today you'd say, if I land here and these people are operating as a society, they've got a structure that's going into place, they've got, they've got their uh, systems of, of making decisions, the first thing you'd actually do is say, I'd like to learn how they do that so we can incorporate it. But unfortunately, ignorance and arrogance doesn't go with common sense. And it's unfortunate that common sense is not common anymore. So what we have to do is you've got to take facts and figures. You take facts and figures today and stack those up against ignorance and arrogance, and you can defeat ignorance and arrogance by saying these are the facts and these are the figures. Say what you like. 30 years ago in our society, suicide never existed. Didn't exist. We didn't know what it was. None of our Aboriginal communities experienced suicide. Three decades later, we are four times the rate of the society in suicides. Six times the rate in diabetes. Women are six times the rate with heart failures. So these figures are alarming for us as a society as Aboriginal people. Why is it alarming? Because we've actually been more affected by today's living than the rest of society. Why is that? Are we weaker? No, no. Because our DNA and our genetic structure that existed for thousands of years got us on a, on a plane that was close to purity. We had an intermarriage system, a bloodline system, say, this is who you can marry. And by looking at that bloodline system and saying who you can marry, it kept it quite pure. So deformities didn't exist. So you find in all the journals that Aboriginal people died from simple things like influenza, which our body had no immune <coughs> uh, within our system to tackle that. You look at the effects of diabetes, that you adjust into the diets. Our bodies weren't, weren't ready to adjust to that. If you were to advocate today, if you were to say, I'm going to draw up a diet that's ideal for each and every one of you in here, I'd guarantee that diet would be what we were eating before settlement started. So if you've got all that knowledge that's here, that knowledge is actually stored internally. Being stored internally, that's why I do these presentations with people like yourself and give you the greatest respect. I'm not going to do it with a PowerPoint. I don't need a book. I don't need a PowerPoint. I don't need prompting because I've acquired that knowledge and pay respect to my elders who handed it down. You see, today, it, it, it's amazing. I still have a giggle when I walk out of places that are quite simple, office places, and there's the last one out, turn off the lights. Don't forget to pack the cups away. Simple instructions 
that to me is a waste of signs. If you don't know your responsibility within your world in that area, then you should be challenged. So our society did not cater for the weakest two and a half percent. We actually catered for the strongest. We had aspirations to be stronger. The tall poppy syndrome didn't exist in our community. That was introduced to us and we tackled it very well and embraced it immensely. But tall poppy syndrome was not a part of our culture. So you found that we had this system that even someone who had mental problems, health problems, were embraced by the other 97.5% and saying, we as a group will look after you. It's the old cliche, it takes a village to raise a child. We all know that. So it weren't, weren't left in isolation. So if you've got 2% 2, 2 of the groups that's got issues, they're easy to follow along. But if you're going to legislate for that 2.5%, You've got a problem with everyone else. And I won't go into legal ramifications because I have debates with lawyers about this all the time, about interpretations. So you can see where I'm coming from here is that you have to have signs everywhere now because the first thing you do as an organisation, your committee had to do it as well, you have to look at risk management. What are our risk management responsibilities? And even people with common sense will say it's gone, it's gone out. You can't have gatherings and barbecues now without these rules and regulations that say you have to have these areas. It threatened the very being of our, 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 our community sporting structures in all of our little country towns and other areas who operated with volunteers. They had to have all these insurance regulations put in place. It threatened them. Why? Because you've got a small group of people that can't adhere to what is expected by the norm. Our society had that in tow. So I'm not here giving you a lecture on you know, what should and shouldn't happen. I'm giving you facts and figures of how we operate as a people. I was very blessed to be brought up in both worlds. I was actually caught up in, in a number of different worlds. So I went out of the bush and from the bush... I was brought up during the years when they had what they called around here, those who were international. We had a, 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 a long period where all of our kids were taken away as part of the stolen generation. It didn't stop until the 70s. So we're not talking about the, the 1800s. We're talking about people my age and younger who were actually taken from their families. As a young man, I knew that I had an older brother and sister. They were taken from my mum when they were born. I caught up with my brother when I was 21 and my sister when I was in my 30s because they were taken away and told they were given away. The structure was actually trying to break that down. So I had foot in both worlds. So I'd go out of the bush where we did nothing wrong and I went through the Catholic system. So they put me into a convent school because the state school kids were taken away continually. The Catholics, we survived a little bit longer um, and my mum was quite smart because when I was born, I was born in Mekathara in my grandmother's country, 500 miles north, registered in Kew. So the day I went to school and they took all my cousins away because they're all registered in the Pinjara area, I missed out. So those kids were taken from school and I, as a six-year-old, sorry, eight-year-old, as eight-year-old, saw my cousins get in a van and you don't see them for 15 years, some for 20 years. So that was actually operated here. And having that knowledge and that background there on that side, knowing what's happening here, then you go to things like confession, and we did nothing wrong, so I had to invent, say, telling lies, which got me for about three confessions, um, prompted me into one stage that one of my mates dropped his marble and I put it in my pocket, and that was fantastic. I felt proud of it, that, because I had to say to Father, I, I stole a marble. That lasted about an hour and a half, because I was brought up with saying things that don't belong to us and not ours, so I had to put it back. So as I gave the marble back, but I still had, I took the marble. So you can see in our society there was a responsibility and a belonging and that was given to us by the strength and respect handed down through communities. You break that up, it's very hard to replace. Respect is something you cannot replace instantly. 
your respect for fellow man, for fellow beings, for the animals, for the plants is something that is handed down and people either they got it or they haven't. Um, I'm going to uh, take a, a different approach at this moment now and talk about structures, how we operated. We operated in structures, and I put on our uh, table over here, I put a little map with six seasons. We operated under a six season system. The six seasons for us made common sense. There was what we call the warm summer, when the summer starts and it's not too, not too bad, we call that uh, um, Birok. In the Birok area, it's quite nice. Then you have Bonnaroo. Bonnaroo is when it's really hot. That's your February time when you're here, those who know, that's hot period. You know the difference between the two. There's also another uh, period that happens, and I mentioned our table, that's between fertility and birth. So you have the winter where everything is fertile, then spring, they're born, and the flowers are out. But there's a season in between called incubation, the budding season, the pregnancy season. So we have those six seasons. And when you put it into that context, it makes sense. In our life, we go from, in our, at the six seasons again, our fertility, incubation, birth. Childhood, adolescence, adult. When you're adult, you go back to the cycles. When I talk to uh, uh, sporting clubs or business clubs, you can put us through the same six seasons. Once you've put it, your financial reports, at the end of the year reports, you're back to start off in fertility again. How are we going to reinvent ourselves for the next one? So we're all in cycles. And those six seasons were our guides. But not only were they our guides, the six seasons took us on cycles that interacted with other groups. And when we interacted with other groups, we shared common grounds. So there were places in the hills that Balladong and Wajak would come together. Then you'd have places that's further south where Wajak would actually work in with Bidinjarup. So you do your circle. And that community uh, building and, and, and networking operated for thousands of years. So you gained respect for all your neighbours and you in, in, uh, included each other. Um, the questions I asked you about the Nomad Two Worlds. Nomad Two Worlds was started by a fellow called Russell James, as you probably gathered in that area. He spent some time with um, uh, a group of people in the, in the northern parts. And um, one of his friends, he befriended was a fellow called Clifton Binderry. So Clifton took Russell out and introduced him to the community, and Russell said, wow, this is fantastic. Those who have seen on Nomad Two Worlds, Russell's a photographer out of New York. He does the Victoria's Secret and Harper's Bazaars and all these wonderful uh, photographic shoots. But he's a local fellow from here, Gosnells. There. And Christmas and those areas, he comes back. So he interacted, he started this Nomad Two World movement up so that he can enable, not control, but enable opportunities between Aboriginal people and the rest of the world on that one. And we can, you can ask questions on that later or even, even analyse a bit further what they've actually done on that way. The other one I asked you to look at was the Natural Resource Stewardship Circle. Now, the Natural Resource Stewardship Circle, for those... Um, uh, I used to be very politically incorrect before by saying women who use cosmetics and perfumes but uh, men involved with that too, so it's, it's not exclusive to women for skin care and, and, and that anymore, so you don't have a monopoly on it. But you find that the biggest companies in the world came together. Clarins, who were in competition with, with the Estee Lauder, who were in competition with Aveda, who were in competition with um, uh, Roche, Givadan. These are the major companies in the world. They came together because of one reason. The reason is that they know that their livelihood depends on plants. If, there's, if they don't have a supply of the plants, they don't have a business. And these are multi-billion dollar businesses. So it makes sense if we as a collective get together and say, let's have a common approach to the plants. And to their credit, and I give them credit, this is the... Yeah, these are people who don't have to listen to anyone. They've got their own researchers and, and, and people in the world. 
they came to our Indigenous knowledge and said, how did you as Indigenous people live in harmony and maintain balance with the plants? We'd like to embrace that knowledge. We don't want it. We want you to keep that knowledge, but we'd like to embrace it. We'll engage with you. How can we get a business out of this so that you can still own the knowledge, supply us as a company? I'm not going to go into that too much because you can read and Google that and follow that later. But embracing Indigenous knowledge is not bad for business. It is good for business. Because if you want a, a, a social network of group of people that operates, we've had that as a blueprint here for thousands of years. Some people who still have the patriarchal and matriarchal structures within their grandmothers and grandfathers still have the say in what's going on within the families that operated us for thousands of years. Buja ngarla bere. Ngank ngarla bere. The land is our provider. So when our women became pregnant, we call it bujari, we're from the land. Every part of us can be made up as part of the land. Uh, I'll finish it off there because I, um, um, uh, you know, we have to have some questions. So if you've got any questions that's coming out from the tables, I'll answer them. Don't worry if they're rude questions. I've got rude answers. I've got, um, yeah, sorry, got a question? Just because you get a mic doesn't mean I have to turn it on. <laughs> What's that? No? It's yeah, you go, sir. Check. Is that okay? Um, I, can, I can check my own. It's not a rude question. No. Uh, Nicole Ross from Straight Talk. We run a lot of deliberative processes where you know, community members come together and deliberate together on a contentious issue and come to consensus, make a consensus decision. I'm interested in traditional decision making processes um, because I understand um, you know, there's communal. There is, there is. Yep, well, the communal decisions are quite... Um, th there's two ways to do it. One is the, the informal way where people get together and have the conversation. And that is usually taken over a period of time. The, the, the more important the subject, the longer the, the longer the talk, the longer the decision. There's another one we do, which we do in a formal one, where we have a talking stick. Uh, we use this quite a bit down here, where the, the stick goes around from the circle, so everyone gets to have a say when they're holding the stick. And if it's something that's trivial, the stick goes around once. If it's something more important, it goes around three times. But by the time it gets to the end, the elder actually holds the stick and make a decision. You'd find that the decisions that are made today, and, and I have this common saying that, you know, Aboriginal people can't get together and make a decision. They can't agree on anything. There's always conflict. Well... Hello? Your actual Western system, Westminster system, is based on conflict. You've got a professional opposition in to keep a government in place. You pay people to create conflict. We do it as a part-time amateur thing. <laughs> so do not preach to us about coming together and having a common approach. Because any of you who work in the government system know that you've only got a minister and that government for two years. This post-election, then gearing up for the next election, you've only got a window of that. If any of you are in the, in the uh, economic world, you know that you need at least seven years to balance out how you're going to run things on an economic cycle. You know that if you're in business, you're going to have three years before you make money. These are common things. So if you're going to keep turning people over, you've got a problem. The thing about Aboriginal communities, you've got consistency. You've got consistency. It's the same people that you're going to speak to that's going around. And that takes a little bit more patience. And they're not going to do it within that time frame that people want it to be done. And that's unfortunate. You have to have that patience. Respect and patience. The only two things you need working with Aboriginal communities, just respect and patience. Yeah, good. Um, just off the back of that, Richard, you're saying about the um, 
you know, the professional conflicts and what have you that the Westminster structure has in place. How do you feel that applies um, and what do you think, if you feel comfortable going into it, about the concept of land councils, for example, in the Northern Territory con context, representing vast numbers of communities um, and being the lead negotiator in many cases for quite disparate and diverse family groups through that structured body of a land council? I just wonder how you see that working when there's so much need for um, you know, extensive collaboration and negotiation as a group, which then ultimately goes back to a peak land council body. Yeah, well, that's, that's based on, again, a Western system by converging numbers into smaller numbers to get decisions, whether they're elected officials or you get uh, peak bodies that actually make decisions on behalf of, of communities. Uh, we completely understand that. But within a lot of those land councils, particularly one here in the southwest, we've got one called the, the Southwest Aboriginal Sea and Land Council, which, for those who are, are, are new, we've, we've, we've won a native title agreement and a settling an agreement down here to say that Aboriginal people did have a system, it did have a structure, and there was a society that operated here pre-settlement. So what we've actually done here is made sure that we do have the peak body, but you also have your cells that operate within the body, and that structure is very important. And the smaller the cells, the stronger the outcomes you'll actually get. Uh, you'd always find that there, there'll be opposition in, in all processes, and there's nothing wrong with opposition. It's the process of how you get to a, a consensus or an opinion for the majority. And I think that's very important to, to understand. It's about, it's about that majority. And if you analyse that into a, into a land council where you've got people that are elected on, uh, you'd find that the majority of governments around the world are not operating with the majority of support. So, you know, that's... Uh, in, a, in a roundabout way, it's not an ideal system, but it's the best to operate. Ideally, you'd go and walk, talk to each of those individual communities. Even within the communities, you're going to talk to families because they're different family structures. Uh, but you'd find the common thing... I usually go to people and uh, ask the common question. So, you know, we're all, we understand that we had a system that operated here. We understand that we had uh, Aboriginal uh, laws and regulations. The big problem came with native title and, and, the, and the, the, uh, the bodies that are operating is that the governments have to operate on lines. You have to have a longitude, a latitude. You have to have a boundary line. Where do you operate? Our, our community didn't have the boundary lines. It was shared. It was a shared line. It wasn't hard and fast. So that's where we got a problem. The same thing happened in other places like the Middle East. You analyse what's happened in the Middle East and those areas that created lines, created these lines in countries that didn't exist before. When you go back to the small tribalism, that's what operated. So we're quite blessed here, because we're blessed here simply because we still have access to the ancient knowledge that I'm passing on to you, that was passed to me. And we do it in a passive way rather than aggressive, saying, you know, you come up here and you stuffed everything up. Um, that's, that's the easy approach. As a matter of fact, we were a part of them. That, some of our people cut the trees down. They were forced to be, become uh, a part of that system. So we've got time for one more question, have we? Go on. Got I've got time for a couple. Oh, that's good. Ten minutes. Two minutes each? Yeah. I'm Richard Ray Scanlon from Bang the Table. Um, I'm really interested. I, I really like... Uh, the fact that you're talking about, uh, you know, settlers leaving the UK and coming here and bringing what they had with them. So they've left poverty, uh, terrible weather, etc. And I tend to think when they came here, they were asp aspirational. And we're still aspirational now. We're an aspirational society. Where it seems to me Aboriginal society is more about what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. So today, living in a society as well where we have disruptive technology and there's quite a bit of disruption. How do we try and change our aspirational society into one that's much more sharing? I, 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 well, aspiration is something we had as well because sometime or other someone invented a boomerang. Sometime or other someone actually got together and said, I'm going to put these different particles together and I'm going to create a plastic. It might have been 10,000 years ago, but it's actually done. So there's aspiration, and Aboriginal people still invent ourselves. So Ngārlawāngi, Ngārlākorawāngi, and I can still speak to you in the Wajak language, but also learnt English. Yeah. And I learnt just enough French and a bit of German to insult people in the language, but uh, 
that's a bit of a nine sprocken si dosh, and then not para francais, and all those sorts of things. I can, I can order croissants and and and, and uh, you know strudels and those sorts of things. But you learn how to adapt, and adapting is very important to us. And I think what happened is that us as a society, Aboriginal people, have adapted very quickly. The technology and, and the the uh, the adaptance of the language. And I challenge people continually. I said, you've been here 200 years, and how many can speak a bit of wajak? We have learned to speak your language. You haven't learned to speak ours. This place has been known as Bilya, Biru. They're still in wajak Buja. So wajak is still here when many countries have changed their names for thousands of years. When I was a young fella, I met people, and some people older than me could talk about that as well. We met people who were older than Australia. Because officially, Australia came together in the Federation in, in 1901. Yeah. I've met people still around too who's older than the flag. So when you look at that, people say it's a young country, but it's actually adapted very quickly. On that area. So we actually adapt quickly, and we have to balance it. Our challenge is to say, what are the cultural values that still resonate today that we can bring into the society? And I'd guarantee that one of those great cultural values is respect. We get respect to our kids, we've got a greater future. Some of the kids have got no idea what respect's about because they weren't handed respect. They weren't brought up with respect. And when you take things like stolen generations, people removed from families, you've disrupted a whole society of handing down respect to try to replace it with discipline. And discipline just doesn't work in that area. Respects the greatest weapon. So I think that one, if that answers that one, how do we do it? Respectfully, we get together. Uh, I love modern technology as much as I do love my dancing. So I'm quite as comfortable in the coders as my julep. There. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, good morning, Richard. Thank you for your welcome this morning and for your welcome that we saw at yesterday's conference. So it was... Um, Oh. It's really good to see that that cultural welcome is being part of conferences here in Australia. Um, I can see that there's probably variation between sectors in terms of how they engage with Indigenous people. Are there any sectors that are doing it really well? Uh, there are sectors that, that, that... The most important one is those who actually go and talk. It's like we're doing now. It's just go and speak to people. And you have to be patient and speak to a number of different ones. Because what happens is that if you've got someone who's an expertise in a particular area, they may not be the expertise in the area that you're talking about. So you, you've got some people who's put up as an Aboriginal leader over here, but they're a leader because of they know this particular area here. What we've managed to do here is to, is to draw up guidelines so people say, if you want to know something about engineering, don't go and talk to Aunty Teresa. She's not going to know anything about engineering. She's not interested in it. She's an elder. That's fine. But we can put you across to Brendan. He studied engineering, and he'll talk to his uncles and aunts. So we do have those people with the knowledge that you're coming to, uh, to talk with within our society that can become interpreters in that area. And that's how those people do it well. You have to have it... I tell people, if you want to engage with Aboriginal people, make sure it's subject relative. Don't grab them just because they're Aboriginal or got family connection. Do they know the subject that you're working on? Have they got knowledge in that area? If they haven't, you can include that and say, we're here about this. I can talk to you about these things now because that's what I was brought up doing. If there's any people in the steel construction area, I was a boiler maker welder, I can talk to you about that. We, the, the difference between the knowledge and the operation is very important. It's like this computer. A lot of us know how to operate it. How many of us know how to build it? How many know what the components are to put it together? And that's what we grab as a community. We have to learn every component. I'm going to finish up with a little challenge for you. And this is a balanced one. This one here is to show you that simplicity is the most complex thing to analyse. And complexity has a lot of its answers in simple analysis. I do that as a sort of the yin and yang because I'm going to challenge you to do something that I think is very simple because I've always done it 
but it may be a challenge to you. So if you've got two hands, we're going to shake the hands. And I'm going to ask you to just to do two things, to say to be successful, stick your thumb up, this is a sign of being successful. So one thumb up, it's up to you. So we can all do that. So that's it. Now what we're going to do now to be successful, we're going to reverse that ten times. I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you one more. Here we go, before we go. I'll give you one more that you can take with you. The knowledge we hold, so we close our fist, the knowledge we hold is passed to us. So we pass it around. Don't drop the knowledge. Now, for me to do that, I listen to my, my mothers and fathers, uncles and aunts, and I had trust and faith in what they handed to me. So there's never a time I couldn't remember doing it. As a child, we were brought up doing it. I didn't have to analyse how it works. They said to me a number of things that still stay with me today. You do not need alcohol to enjoy yourself. I still don't drink alcohol because I was actually given that advice by strong people. You do not need cigarettes to create an image, and I don't smoke cigarettes. So those simple things that were handled to me in that physical sense came along with all the others, respect other people because you don't know what they've done or they've been through. You have to have respect for people. So to this day in our culture, we give respect straight away. You don't have to earn it. The Western society say, well, you have to earn your respect. We give it. You can lose it. But you can get it back again. So respect is very important. So all of those things were handed down to me under a system that I have now that I can build within my structure, my computer, so that I can operate and give out information that I've actually acquired over a number of years and still acquiring today. Out of today's sessions, I will learn something. In our culture, we're like trees. We don't stop learning till we, uh, till we die. The tree doesn't stop growing until it dies. So that's, you know, thanks very much again. Uh, Joel, um, if, if, if anyone's got any problems with my presentation, you know who to go to. You go to Joel and say, <laughs> you bring that person around again and you're responsible. But uh, it's about that. It's about connections. It's what you're doing today, influence, engage and lead. It's about who we are and who we, how we connect to people. And I think that's important. So thank you very much for, for all that.